All right, well, let's stand briefly, quickly, and we're going to just lead you in a little prayer, and then we're going to get right into the Word. So, so thank you, Father, for your Word. Thank you that it has the ability to transform me. And I ask that you'd give me eyes to see and ears to hear what you're saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So uh, we're gonna, my wife and I are going to be tag teaming a little bit this morning, and there's a message that we're working on. So this is kind of like a first draft. We've got some material from Being Health, but it has to do with addictions. And uh, it might be a two-week series, so you might hear the rest next week, depending on how far we get in it today. Uh, but we're believing God that this information will be transformational for us as a church. So I want to start this morning in Col- Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. And uh, Paul is speaking here. And he says, and now just as you accepted Christ, Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him and let your lives be built on him. And then your faith will grow strong in truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thanksgiving. And so just leave the verse up there, Brian, for a minute. Um, there's, there's four things here that, that, that uh, have to take place in order. Okay, number one, it says, that we have to accept Christ. How many here have accepted Christ? Let me see your hands, okay? You've accepted Christ. And the Bible says, by grace we've been saved through faith, not of works, lest any will show both. So we're not, we're a grace church. Say we're a grace church. So we understand that it's not of our works. We can't earn salvation. It's been accomplished through the finished work of the cross. We're saved because of what he has done. But we also understand that there's a process of sanctification that happens in our lives. Okay? And I know people that have accepted Christ. This is the first step. Say the first step. Accept Christ. They've accepted Christ, um, and they've been radically touched by God, and they've come to me and said, hey, I don't know what it is, but things are different. I see things different. I, I just feel, I feel clean inside. I sense when I pray that God is connected to me. I can hear God. When I read the Bible, it comes alive. How many know what I'm talking about? So they've accepted the Lord. And so that work of grace has begun in their life. But the second thing Paul tells us to do, say the first thing is accept him. But the second thing is continue to follow Jesus. So Paul says, once you've accepted him, you need to continue to follow him. Okay? Even when things don't make sense. And how many know you become a Christian and then all of a sudden you're reading the Bible or you hear a sermon or, uh, you know, something comes across. It just doesn't make sense to you. And it's at that, it's at that point where many people uh, fall away. I knew a, a girl that I led to the Lord when I was in business school and she would come to church. Uh, she came to hear me preach. We were going to business school and she came to church and she got saved and she was like, Travis, my life has changed. And she would weep through the services and she, she just had this inner peace that she was seeking in the New Age movement and couldn't find. She found it in Christ and she was doing really good. And then she came across Romans chapter 2, which talks about you know homosexuality and she could not fathom that and it went against everything that she understood as just and she just she 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 began to pull away from god because she couldn't settle with this truth how many know what i'm talking about okay and um we need to continue to follow jesus even when things don't seem right in john chapter 7 uh the whole chapter of john chapter 7 jesus is with his followers and he does something crazy and radical he says to his followers hey listen if you're going to follow me you have to eat my flesh and you need to drink my blood and 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 they they didn't like that they thought what's he what's he what's he getting at this 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 is a hard thing in john chapter 6 verse 60 it says many of his disciples said this is a very hard thing to understand how can anyone accept it and you know what, there's teaching today in the, in the Bible that we should be teaching, but we're, we're afraid because we think, how will people accept it, right? It, it goes against political correctness. It goes against uh, the social cult, fabric of our culture. We, we can't talk about this anymore. And, and so what happened here, okay, in John chapter, get this, 666. Did you get it? Go to the next verse. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And that's what happens when, when you can't accept the truth, you have to make a choice. Am I going to continue to follow and hope that I'll understand one day, or am I going to desert the Lord? And this is what they did. At this point, they turned away. 
This is actually a sign of the end times in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 and 3. We say, Paul's warning, he says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit uh, or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So there were people teaching that, hey, you missed the rapture. Jesus has already returned. And Paul says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And so I believe we're going to have revival moving in the end days. It's already happening. But there's also going to be a falling away from biblical truth. How many know we're already seeing that? We're not, we're preaching messages on prosperity, we're preaching messages on victory and the gifts of the Spirit and all these things, and they're good things, but we're neglecting talking about the things that really matter. Amen? We're, we're neglecting talking about sanctification and the preparation for eternity. And we need to be doing that. Okay? So we need to continue to follow Him. Say, continue to follow Him. <laughs> and then the next step, that we see in that verse. So we're to accept him, we're to continue to follow him, and then the, Paul says, let your roots go down into him. Okay? Let your roots go down deep into him. And so the disciples, many of the disciples said, Jesus, man, we can't follow you anymore. This is a hard saying. No one's going to accept it. Your ministry, you've just shot yourself. Your ministry is going to go down. And so they all left. And so Jesus turns and he looks at his 12. We go to John chapter 6, verse 67, and look what Jesus says. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? Okay. And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? Because you have the words that give eternal life. And this is a place that we have to uh, realize is that Jesus has the words of eternal life. Okay. The, the uh, truth is not a philosophy. The truth is not a, a worldview. The truth is a person named Jesus Christ. And, and Peter understood this. Hey, you are the truth. Okay? And so Paul tells us, I'm just breaking down Colossians here. What he tells us in the very next verse, in verse 8, he tells us what the fruit is going to be if we do these three things. Okay? This will be the result. Number four, then your faith will grow strong in the truth that was taught. Your faith will grow strong in the truth that was taught. Okay? And then the next thing he says, it will produce an overflow of thanksgiving. So when the truth comes into our hearts and we accept it as truth, and we realize a lot of truth will go against social fabric, social culture, it's going to go against, it always has. And when you accept it as truth and say, I'm going to allow God's truth to transform me, even if it's not popular, the Bible says you'll become strong in the truth, your faith will grow, and the second thing is it will produce an overflow of thanksgiving. Say overflow of thanksgiving. So a sign of someone who's strong in faith is they go around always going, oh, I'm so thankful. Thank God. God is so good. Praise the Lord. Thank you for my children. Thank you for my family. Thank you for this trial I'm going through, God, because I'm going to come out the other end, and I'm going to have victory. And there's a thankfulness that begins to pour out of your heart. Why? Because there's maturity. Does this make sense to anybody? Amen. Okay? And then as we continue in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 to 14, look what Paul says. Don't let anyone capture you. He's talking to the church. So, so how easy is it we get captured with empty philosophies? You know, you can sit and you can, especially today, knowledge has increased. You can go on the internet and you can listen to all kinds of stuff and you can watch TED Talks and you can watch this philosopher and you can watch this theologian and you, there's information, information. And Paul's saying, don't let anybody capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that comes from, there's two sources, human thinking and from spiritual powers of the world. Right? Satan is the god of this world, rather than from Christ. And so, these philosophies come from human thinking and demonic thinking. Those are the two ways that it's coming. But then Paul continues and he says, rather you need to get your information or your revelation from Christ, verse 9, it says here, 
For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body, so you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. And so Christ is the head. So you want spiritual truth, you want have understanding, you want wisdom, look to Jesus, right? That's why our, our, our mission statement as a church is to, to live like Jesus and to share his love. Why? Because when you live like Jesus and you model Jesus, you're actually you're operating in the truth at the highest level. Does this make sense? All right. Verse 11. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. We know in the Old Testament the Jews had a cutting off of the excess flesh. I'm not going to go into detail, but there was a cutting away uh, of excess. And the Bible says that when in the New Testament, Christ performs a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. Okay? Verse 11. Are we at verse 11? Go back to verse 11. I want to say, see this. When you came to Christ, you were, past tense, circumcised. It's already happened. When you accepted Christ, you were, the cutting of the way of the flesh happened, okay? Why? For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to newness of life, because you trusted in the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Okay? Verse 13. We have verse 13 there. You were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Your sinful nature was cut away in Christ. You can't go around going, I'm I'm just a sinner and I have a sin nature and I'm just trying to overcome. No, your sin nature was cut off, past tense. Say, my sin nature was cut off. Now, that doesn't mean you, you won't be tempted. That's why we do highway of wholeness and encounters. We talk about temptation, how the enemy comes. But you don't have to give in to sin anymore. Before you were a Christian, you didn't have a choice. You ended up just kind of like a slave doing what you didn't want to do sometimes. But now you have a choice because that thing was cut off. Isn't that good news? All right. And so it says here in verse 13, you were dead because of your sins, because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all of our sins. All right. He canceled the record. And the charges against us took it away by nailing it to the cross. I want you to say this with me. Say, my sin nature has been cut off. Okay, I want you to say with me, I've accepted Jesus. I'm choosing to continue to follow him. And I'm going to let my roots go deep into him. But a lot of people don't know what that means. What does it mean to let your roots go deep into Christ? Well, I have a verse for you. Are you ready for it? This verse is going to show you what it means, and then we're going to get into our, that's my intro, then we're going to get into this teaching on addictions, is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19, and it says this, Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand all God's, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. The love of God is what we need to be rooted in. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness and the life and the power that comes from God. And so addictions are rooted in What's it rooted in, honey? I'm gonna tell them, She's going to tell them. I'm going to let her take over. All right. So, Camilla, why don't you come up? We're going to talk about addictions. You guys all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, and I just want to say, too, before we do this, so we were singing about every high thing must come down and every stronghold must be broken. So, you know, when there's high things, there is bondages, too. 
High things is those imaginations and those thoughts and those lies that tries to argue with God's word in our lives. And we all have them coming at us, and, and f- even from within us sometimes. And we all have to fight them. So like Travis said, we're standing here learning with you. We haven't conquered everything ourselves yet, but we're going to be pressing in and we're going to learn and we are going to overcome little by little together. So we're speaking, and this is quite a bit of information, so I'm going to be having my notes, and I apologize, I'm going to have to look at them sometimes because I haven't memorized all of this. Maybe we will one day, but um, it's lots of good information. And I want to say too that God comes not to condemn, he comes to convict. So we're not here to condemn either, we're here to, like, well, we're not here to convict, but we're here to share the word of God, and the Holy Spirit comes to convict us. And I want to say, ever since, you know, we come in more in this journey of digging deeper with roots. I feel like uh, repentance has become a sweet word. Like, you know, it's like so good. We're still in the dispensation of grace. We're not facing, we're not standing before the judgment throne yet. And we have a time and we have a chance to repent. And we have a chance to have high things come down and bondages be broken in our lives. And we should be grateful for that. So we shouldn't be intimidated when we get convicted. When God's word comes and pierces in our hearts, it's a good thing. So we need to come to that place. And, you know, because that's humility, that's the first step before we can, you know, if my people who are called by my name, the first step is humble yourself and then pray and seek my face. And then you get the power from turn to turn from the wicked ways. Many times we try to think that we have to turn from the wicked ways first, but you can't. You know, so you have to humble yourself first, and then you have to pray. Seek his face. And sometimes you have to seek it again, because sometimes you're going to come up against it, and you might say, no, I don't think I can do it. But I'm here to say today, yes, you can do it with his help, because you're not alone, and so with his help, you can do it, and I can do it too, and we're in it together. So, addictions. Addictions is really simple to understand when we look at what the, what we say that the definition is. And we're going to be drawing a lot of this. The material is coming from Being Health and from Henry Wright. So it's not something we've come up with, but it's def, you know coming from the Word of God, of course. So addictions is rooted in a need to be loved. Okay, and of course this Christmas season, what is it all about? It's about God sending his son you know, in his love, he sent his son, the very best thing he had for us. And, you know, why do we see so many people come up with addictions at holiday times, Christmas times, you know, going to things, you know, it's supposed to be a season of joy. But you look around, and is everybody happy inside? No. Many times you start pressing on the heart, and people, a lot of people start feeling, you know, the suicide rates goes up, partying goes up, addictions goes up, drinking, drugs... Um, you know, inappropriate, inappropriate relationships. Because why? Because people are hungry for that need to be loved, but they don't know it. They don't understand it. So they go to all different things, and it heightens at the holiday season. So that's part part of why we want to talk about it now. So addictions crop up in people's lives when we haven't been properly loved by family members or by other people in our lives that should have been loving us. And um, so we have this deficit, and we have this need to be loved. And mankind ha- has then developed all sorts of products and ideas and things in the media and things that um, uh, you can fill yourself with. And what it does is it, it brings uh, like a dopamine rush, and it mimics love. So, But all that is coming as a false comforter, and actually it's coming to destroy you. Because any addiction that's coming uh, and that is exercised year after year will really wear down on your immune system and your life and your confidence. And it also brings such a guilt and torment. And so we really want to help you to understand what addictions is and where it's coming from. And I want to say one little nugget here too. The, there's a difference between temptation and sin. And so when we don't understand that difference, it brings a lot of guilt in our life because you really can't hinder fly, a, a bird from flying over your head, but you can hinder it from building a nest in your hair. So you, you'll get thoughts, you'll get temptations, but that's not sin. So you can learn to nip it at that level. We all, we all get that. You, you, you know, it doesn't matter who. We all will be tempted, but we don't all have to sin. So I just want to encourage you with that in your journey of overcoming guilt is that if you can learn to separate in your own life, okay, is this a temptation or is this sin? 
Sin is when you're actually acting on that temptation. And it's also when you keep practicing it. You know? So, addiction, if we should define it, is anything that you would set your affections on. And all those things that you set your affections on, <clears throat> those are the things that you're going to go after to comfort you. But then it comes like a false comforter. So it's just a false comforter. And so we were created with this incredible need for love, and only God the Father can really fill that need. And if he doesn't fill it, we're going to be looking to fill it with other things. That's just a natural, that's how we are wired, because we need it. It's like we need food and we need air, we need love and acceptance. So um, as, as we talk about addictions, it's actually something that we all, everyone battles at at some level. So it's not just, you know, we typically associate addictions with drugs, alcohol, gambling, and those are definitely a little bit more visible things. But there are a lot of other addictions too that no doubt we've all dipped our toes in at times and, you know, uh, participated in one way or another from time to time. So I don't want you to sit here and think, well, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't gamble, so I, maybe I'll just take a nap, you know, while she's talking about this. No, stay awake, stay alert, and learn a lot. <laughs> yeah, so, um, because addictions can take on many, many forms. You know, relationships can be addictive. There's something that has been noticed in relationships, and it's in the word, and it's called inordinate relationships. Oh, sorry, inordinate affection, it's called. It's when there's an ungodly tie between two individuals, there are situations where females would become codependent with one another, and it can happen with males too. Inordinate affection in the clinical state is actually called situational homosexuality. It's a little deep. If you want to know more, you have to come to high with a wholeness. Okay? So it's something that we, that's very serious. And we find it in prisons very often, and it doesn't always involve actual sexual acts, as homosexuality would, but it involves a bonding an ungodly bonding of members of the same sex. So, um, so what the root is behind all of these addictions, behind inordinate affection, illegal drug effect addiction, legal drug addiction, which is a real addiction as well, what's behind all of that is a need to be loved. So um, anything that you cannot lay down as an act of your own will is an addiction. Anything that controls you, that rules you, that is actually that is actually your master. So, it, and if it is something other than the true master, our Lord Jesus and our Savior, then it's addictive and it's ungodly. So, <clears throat> you might be starting to think of some things, you know, in your own life that might be ruling you that are not of Him. How about TV, soap operas? Perhaps you know the TV runs twenty four seven. And from that, you know, you might have learned some things in life that you really shouldn't have learned about, and it's unfortunate. Um, you know, it might have been a false comforter in your home, one of them. Um, perhaps your parents weren't very present, you know, as they should have been. So maybe the TV was the adult companionship coming through the TV. Today we can take technology with us everywhere. We can connect on Facebook, we can connect on Twitter, on Instagram, we all do this with our thumb, right? Just uh, motioning it, and we're just swiping and scrolling through there and seeing if anybody's there to connect, if anybody's there to like me, you know, to like what I said, to notice me, you know, have anything good to say about me, you know, like, that one like me, that one loved me, you know, and we see that more in the younger generation. There's just that craving of the attention and the you know, becoming famous. So that's all stemming in the need to be loved and noticed because we all have that need. So you'll sit there for minutes, maybe for hours, checking all of these electronic devices out, you know, all these communication ways. Did I get an email? Did I get a text? Do I have a voicemail? Did someone tweet me? Did someone like my post? You know, so you just see how the enemy is drawing us in, you know, um, in the, into this little screen Instead of us having face-to-face -face real conversation like we were created to, you know, our Savior wants that with us. He longs for that. He says, come, let us reason together. You know, he's not intimidated by us coming with our trouble. He's not intimidated with us coming with our junk. 
You know, he really wants that. You know, and because he says, come let us reason together. So when you have questions, go to God. You know, go to him. And you can go to your brother and sister too, but they might be able to help you and they might not. But God does, you know. And he wants that face-to-face conversation. So what happens when you try to take an addiction away? Have you thought about that? Have you ever tried to take the cigarettes away, the alcohol, the gambling? Yeah, there's withdrawal symptoms. But there's something else that happens before those withdrawal symptoms. And that's a temper tantrum. Right? Now, it's understandable to see a little toddler have a temper tantrum. But it gets pretty ugly when there's an adult doing it. (laughs) And so, I guess Henry Wright was saying that he had done this little thing. He had handed out soothers to adults. (laughs) He says, here, take one of those, try that. (laughs) So um, so it's a good gauge, you know, I think, that if someone's trying to take something away, it might even be you trying to take something away in your own life, and you're starting to feel that war within yourself, and it's like, you know, you can't seem to make that decision. That battle is going, going on inside of you. You know, it's because the enemy, he doesn't want you to win. He doesn't want you to get the victory. He doesn't want you to command him to go. He doesn't want you to make a quality decision for your life. He wants you to constantly go to him as your source, as your comforter, but he's a false comforter. Because all he does is take you into more and more, because with addiction, it's just never enough, okay? You're always going to go, like, from one addiction to the next, and you're going to, it's just the way it's going to work. Maybe it's food. So you turn to the food. I think I've done that sometimes. I mean, we're we're not standing here innocent. (laughs) I think we're laughing because, you know, we have, we have touched these things, all of us, in one way or another. So after you've had that whole bag of Doritos or something, you're not really hungry anymore. But now you can go, because you still have that need to be loved, you might go to the electronics. Then you get a cramp in your thumb. So now you turn on the, you know, you turn to the alcohol maybe. Yeah, or to the illegal drugs. Anything that will help you to check out so that you don't have to face the reality, because the reality might be too painful. And that's many times what happens when we have pain, unresolved pain in our hearts and lives. That's why we're so thankful that God has introduced caring for the heart that Travis' parents are doing, you know, because it helps you deal with pain that's not resolved in your heart. So when you have, you know, a sign that you're going to things like this, you might be hiding something in your heart that God actually wants to put his thumb on, because he's a good God. And again, he's not there to condemn you. He's there to convict you so that you can become free. So the high things can come down. You know, the Bible says that if any thought is trying to argue against the word of God, we we must take it captive, we must take it down. So you have to work with him. He's there to work with you, but you have to work with him too. So checking out in front of the TV, sitting in the recliner with your remote, something else is going to cramp your thumb now, right? Are you following what I'm saying here? Yeah. So Satan's kingdom uses many mechanisms to snare you because he knows that you have a need to be loved. It's natural and normal, actually, to have a need to be loved, but the enemy will pervert it. So we have to face that, that it, that's a healthy, you know, healthy need. So we can't be condemned for that, but the enemy tries to do that. He always comes to pervert. Um, I was doing, I was reading uh, a book called... Um, uh, it's by uh, Captivating, I think it's called. It's talking about a woman's, the female heart and the desires that God has built into us. And I thought it was so interesting. It, it, it really helped me understand myself and validate myself and other women. And there's a, you know, one about men too, um, Wild at Heart, where it talks about the core needs of a man's heart. And you know, I think it's when, when you understand some of these things that God has actually created us in his image, you know, that Love is just who he is. It's his character. So we have that need. It's actually a very godly and healthy need to have, you know, have that need to be loved. So we shouldn't be ashamed of that. It's just how we walk that out is important. Yeah, I've got to hurry up, right? Okay, so. Um, and also, if you're in a relationship out of a need, that's addictive and ungodly too. That is interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, somebody might say, I can't live without that person. I mean, I need you. Or, That's actually not healthy. 
you know, and we've been there. I mean, I remember when we first got married, Travis would say, you know, I can't fill that. Like, I can't do, give you that, what you're looking for. And, you know, it would hurt. But then it's it's reminding you that, no, you know, I mean, yes, we can learn to, to give and to to love each other better. But it's really just God that can do that first. And then our relationships can be a blessing, right? So um, we've been around people where we're very close friends, and all of a sudden, maybe one of those friends gets another friend. And then we go, how dare you? You're my friend, right? So that's actually not willing to share. That's called, that's addictive too. Because we don't own anybody. You know, a relationship is a gift. It's a privilege. It's not something we own. It's not something we're entitled to. I mean, we should be having healthy relationships from the ones that are there to cover us and protect us. But because that's how God created us. So what's the power behind these addictions? I mean, doesn't it seem like we should just be able to lay it down? We should just be able to let it go? What's the power behind it? So that's going to be Travis now talking about that. Sure. But I don't have any addictions, though. You know, actually, last Saturday night, so last Saturday night, I was watching a movie with Hannah. We were watching a video. And, and uh, so I woke up in the middle of the night. Uh, probably around two o'clock, and I was just my stomach was so sore. I went and laid on the couch and said, "Oh, I don't feel good. I'm going to throw up." My and she woke up. She said, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" And I'm like, "You know, I, I just don't feel good." And I didn't tell her at the, the moment, so she stayed up all night writing the sermon, putting this together. That's what we're doing now. This is last Sunday. So in the morning, I woke up and I'm, "Hey, I'm great. I'm great." And she's like, "What do you mean you're great?" I said, and then I confessed. I said, "Well, last night I was sitting with Hannah. We were sitting on the couch, and we opened a family sized bag of salt and vinegar chips." <laughs> And we're watching a movie, and the next thing you know, I, I'm like, there's no chips left. And I look down, and, the, and this is like this big, and they were gone. I think Hannah ate most of them, but she's not here to defend herself. But I'll tell you, I just, I, so I was feeling sick because I, I had eaten too many salt and vinegar chips. So that's, that's my confession. So now, yeah. And, and I just want to say, I used to battle fear of throwing up. If you knew me, oh, like, if, you, if you've been close. So I was like, okay. He's feeling sick, and it's uh, Saturday night. Somebody's going to preach tomorrow. Um, I'm going to do two things here. First of all, I'm going to face the fear. I'm not going to be worried about this sickness. And the second of all is I'm going to tell, so I told the devil, I said, you make him sick, I will preach, and I'll preach about addictions, okay? And guess what? He didn't get sick. So I guess he didn't want us to preach about addictions. But here we are. Thank God for the salt and vinegar chips. There we go. All right. So what's the power behind it? And I want to I talk about a word here. Uh, or a phrase, is spiritual bewitchment. Okay, spiritual bewitchment. We see this actually um, in Galatians chapter 3, um, verse 1. It says this. Um, do we have the scripture there? O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Okay? And, um, and so we see this word bewitchment. Okay? And now in Genesis chapter 3, verse 11, the Lord asked Adam and Eve a question, didn't he? He said, who told you that you were naked? That was the question. Who told you? And this is the same thing Paul is asking the church in Galatia. He's saying, who told you? Who bewitched you with these ideas? Okay, And um, so here Paul is saying to the Galatians, who has bewitched you? And I'm going to my notes because I've changed them all. Let's see where we are here. I'm going back to mine. Yeah. Uh, so again, we, we realize there's two streams of ideas that flow. They flow from, from the human side, human thinking, and also spiritual rulers or demonic thinking that flows in. And so they were getting the wrong information, the Galatians. And Paul says, who told you this? Who has bewitched you from the simplicity of the gospel to do things that are not according to the will of God? Now, that word bewitch is actually the word from the Greek, means to malign, okay? It's talking about, um, uh, and the word malign actually as a verb means to speak harmful untruths about. And so to, to, to malign is to speak harmful untruths. And so the enemy has spoken harmful untruths about our God. And he does it even from pulpits sometimes. Sermons are preached out of context. Scriptures are taken out of contrast to put fear in people instead of building faith. And, 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 and the enemy wants us to, to, to see God incorrectly. And that word, that word bewitch means to just speak the truth as an untruth. That's what bewitchment means, okay? 
And so he says, you're foolish Galatians, you're unintelligent, you're unwise, okay? Because you're, you're taking truth that's been bewitched or been twisted, okay? Um, has anyone here ever had that happen to you? It's happened to me, right? And so what happens with addictions, okay, to produce the foundation of addictions is this spiritual bewitchment because the lie is that a false comfort a false comfort is going to make me feel better. It's going to solve my problems. That's what bewitchment is. Oh, man, you know, if I could just get a buzz, I'd be fine. If I could just, you know, have another drink, I'd be fine. If I could just get more people to like me on Facebook, and I'd be fine. If I could get more, you know, and whatever your addiction is, it's, it's a false sense of comfort. The enemy saying, you know, this will make you comfort. This will bring comfort to you, right? And um, Matthew chapter 22 tells us the gospel is very simple in telling us how to defeat bewitchment. And that is found in Matthew 22, verse 37 and 40. Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So this is we're supposed to be addicted to God. Say, I'm supposed to be addicted to God. You see, Adam and Eve in, in the garden, they were walking in fellowship with God. They, they, they had conversation with God. They, they, there was a love relationship, a friendship between God and Adam, and I'm sure Eve, there was that relationship, right? And so here, we're supposed to be addicted to God. We're supposed to love Him with everything that is within us, right? And then, you'll be able to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because as you love God, you, you get the love of God, and you begin to love yourself, then you can love others. Does that make sense? And that's why these two commandments hang all the commandments of the Bible. It's a heart thing that God is after. So these addictions are rooted in a need to be loved because when we've been bewitched into believing that we're not loved, then we're looking for a fix somewhere else. Okay, And I'm one who dealt with addictions, and I just believe the lie that I'm not loved. I believe the lie that, you know what, I'm not popular, and I don't have enough friends, and nobody cares about me, so I'm just going to do some drugs, and I, if I get a buzz, I'll feel good about myself. And I was in a place where if I wasn't high, then, or I wasn't drinking, then I felt I didn't like who I was. How many know what I'm talking about? Is I just, I'm not nice to be around. People don't like being around sober Travis, so i got to just buzz myself. And that, that was kind of the state I lived in because I lived with an unloving spirit that God revealed to me. And it's only broken when you know the love of God. And, and the beautiful thing was when I got saved, I got saved. I was living in Toronto, so guess where I went? I went to the Toronto Airport Church every four or five times a week, and I laid in the presence of God, and I soaked. And I just got so in love with God and so filled with His love that... All the addictions broke off at once. I didn't want drugs, didn't want drink, didn't want... I didn't need it anymore because I found my identity in God. And so people, you can say, we can say, yeah, I know God loves me, but if you really, really know it, experientially the love of God, the addictions break. And so our goal as a church and as pastors and the leaders of this church is if you're struggling with addiction, we want to bathe you in the love of God. We want you to understand that God loves you unconditionally, that he's not holding his sin, your sin against you. It's been nailed to the cross. It's a new day. And that's our heart as a church is to reveal God's love to you. Okay? And so it's that simple. Say it's this simple. The love of God revealed in me will break addictions in me. Okay? And so that's what we want. We want to take the word of God from Logos, which is the written word. It's the explanation of the word. And we want it to become rhema word, which means revealed to me. How many want God's love revealed in higher levels, right? Okay? And so um, the enemy, here's what happens. Your enemy knows that if he can get you into a place where you don't feel loved by God, if you don't don't love yourself, and you don't believe that anybody else loves you either, then he knows that you're going to begin to look for that fulfillment in other places. Amen? And so what we're going to do next week, we're going to finish this message, and um, we're going to talk about what happens in the brain. We're going to talk about serotonin, how when you believe the thoughts of the enemy, it releases serotonin where, and, and, and dopamine, and it affects the way you think about yourself so that you look for other sources. We're going to talk about some science behind all this. But 
for we don't want to overwhelm you for today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have Camilla end with a prayer here. You want to finish with the prayer? We'll pray it again next week as well. How many receive something out of this? Amen. Well, why don't we stand? And we're going to finish with the last page. Here's a prayer. My wife will pray. And then we're going to release you. Also, I want to say, if you need a prayer, after this prayer, if you want prayer, uh, for if you have sickness or any need, we do have a prayer team that's going to be up here praying. Uh, if you don't know Jesus and you want to come into relationship with Christ, please come up and tell the prayer team we want to pray with you as well. Amen? Awesome. Go ahead, Camilla. Okay, so just before I pray that to you, I just want to say, like, we were kind of struggling, should we do this on a Sunday morning? But we just think this is so important, so we are doing it. But if, again, to get more full effect, please go through the Highway to Wholeness and things that we're going to... If you can't come up next Sunday, like, it would be really good for you to come up next Sunday to hear the rest, too. But if you can't, you can always listen online, and because we really want you to get this, okay? So let's pray. I'll pray for you. So, Father, I thank you for your love, and I thank you that you have preserved your word for all of mankind to know who you are. Father, I pray that each and every one of us will choose to seek you in a relationship in your word so that we can defeat these works of the flesh that are in our lives. I speak now to the neurology and the nerve endings of everyone who is bound by prescription drugs, and I command them to be cleansed. Anyone who is bound by addictions to illegal drugs in the name of Jesus, I release you from your ancestral bondages and from those genetic impurities. And I command right now that all serotonin levels be normalized, all dopamine levels be normalized in the name of Jesus. And Father, I speak to any imbalance of biochemistry, and I command it to be normalized too. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So God bless you, and hang tight till next Sunday. Amen. Awesome. And again, I just said as... Camilla was in. I really sense. Uh, um, could Bianca? Could you play something on the piano for a minute too, as well? Um, if you this message is hitting your heart and saying, you know, I really want to know the love of God, and I've really struggled with that. Please come up. Let the prayer, tell the prayer team. Hey, I just want. You don't even have to say what your addiction is. Just say, I'm really struggling with knowing God's love, and we're going to pray with you. Amen. Okay. Have a great week, guys, and we'll see you next week.